Eight is enough, won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to the Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about Battle, Battle Beyond, Beyond the Stars. stars. I like how we literally never rehearsed that, yet we do it the yeah. same every time. Very well. It's it's uh <laughs> it's ingrained. It is, it is. Take your, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I know. The sound effects are so great. Good Lord. So great. So nice watching a ripoff movie that's actually not terrible. Well, it was a ripoff movie of a ripoff movie of a ripoff movie. That is true. It was very uh, incepted by John Sayles. But it was good. I mean, that's what, you know. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> it's not it the greatest was. movie ever, but it was good. Huh. Uh, Take yourself back to 1980. Uh, March 1st, the Voyager 1 probe confirms the existence of Janus, a moon of Saturn. The V'ger, remember? Uh, V'ger, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to go through that horrible thing again. Star Trek the motion picture. Uh, Voyager 1 has been operating for 44 years, 8 months, and 7 days as of today. You know, the actress in uh, Star Trek the motion picture actually shaved her head. That was a big deal back then. Yeah. She was a very beautiful actress, and everybody was like, she shaved her head. A woman shaved her head, and people lost their minds. Wow. That's dumb. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) Uh, Voyager 1 is the most distant man-made artificial object from Earth. Uh, It's still truck along and apparently they still talk to it they still are able to communicate with it i talk to it every night weird i know you do (laughs) hey feature make my dreams come true (laughs) may 21st star wars episode 5 the empire strikes back the second movie of lucas's at the time planned 12 movie opus goes into wide release eventually garnering garnering over a half billion dollars in box office man waiting at school (laughs) <laughs> to get out to go see that movie was the most difficult thing I've ever done in school, I think. Yeah. It was so oh, antsy. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. my God, man. Because, you know, I didn't know Star Wars was going to be Star Wars. I had the posters, yeah. and I was like, I really want to yeah. see this. I hear it's great. But, you know, Empire Strikes Back was like, it was a well, event. I, I mean, yeah. it was the event, man. You knew what you were going to see yeah. was going to be amazing. Amazing. And it was, I can't even. The. the, the yeah, it was. Really I, st- crazy. I can still feel that feeling of like <laughs> of anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> May twenty second, uh, literally the next day. Didn't really feel that when I went to go see Battle Beyond the Stars. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Lucas spent three years making Empire Strikes Back, and Roger Corman spent three months making Battle Beyond the Stars. Hey, for Corman, so. that is three years, baby. Yeah, well, that's true, actually. <laughs> Uh, the next day, May 22nd, Pac-Man, the highest earning arcade game of all time, is released in Japan. You know it was called Puck-Man. Yeah. Because yeah, he do. looks like a puck. Yeah, we do. We it do. makes so much more sense. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it was just tr- bad translation. Well, it, they also didn't want to make it into the F word. Because <laughs> they could easily <laughs> turn true. the Puck-Man into, into the, the fuck me, yeah, the beep the man. The F word man, yeah. Um, yeah, so there you so go. Pac-Man it's, it is. No pucks, no Puckman. No, no, that's a Pacman. <laughs> no, Herbie Puckman. I guess Pacman goes kind of because he's packing it in, but Puckman was a lot. No, better. I don't think it really had any meaning whatsoever. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't speak Japanese. I don't know if that means something in Japanese. Uh, well, it was called Puckman because he looked like a hockey puck. No, I know that, but I'm saying Pac, <laughs> the Pac-Man part of it. Okay, this is going to be a three-hour show. It is because we're, we're going to argue, argue about this about for Pac-Man. the next two hours and fifty minutes. Just like being in the, in the car with your parents during your long drive to grandma's <laughs> house over the summer. <laughs> September 8th, Battle Beyond the Stars premieres to cash in on the space opera craze. Battle, Battle Beyond, Beyond the Stars. The stars. Uh, I got to admit, it may have started as a cash in by the creators of the film, but I really enjoyed it. We, I thought it was fun. It was well written. Definitely worth your time. Well, you had real talent behind it. Unlike. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> The other abominations Star that we talked about. Crash, yeah. which is nothing. Yeah, they didn't yeah. just... Re- <laughs> John Sayles didn't just read the novelization of Star Wars and, and, and make the movie. He actually watched uh, Kira <laughs> Kurosawa's Seven he Samurai. two movies. <laughs> and The Magnificent Seven to rip off and make a Star Wars. Yeah. Which Star Wars was basically a ripoff of Kira Kurosawa's movies as well. It's a very deep yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah. rip-off situation going on here. But they all kind of went to the source, yeah. with, which is Kurosawa. Well, you you 
base your stuff off of good movies, more than likely your stuff's going to be good. It also shows that heroes and legends transcend language and country yeah. and time, and you can make whatever story you want, whether Very it's a Western or a space Western. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, So Battle Beyond the Stars is the brainchild of Roger Corman, king of the B-movies, and finder of incredible talent. Mm, Like me. Yes, yes. Uh, Jim's first job was working for Roger Corman. Oh, my God. I worked in the office for half of it, and I worked on a movie for half of it. And so I'm going to have a very little insider look as we go through. <laughs> how, how long did you work for him? Uh, it was a summer. a summer. It was a summer okay. internship. Between oh, yeah. That's soft, right. You were in uh, junior and senior year. And then they offered me a job, which I, I should have taken. You should have taken. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as uh, we will evidence and, and be proved, uh, <laughs> so many people yes. that Roger Corman worked with oh my God. have become huge names. But my, I, it would have broke my mom's heart. She wanted me to graduate right, from college. Right. So. I understand that. You got to do it for your mom. <laughs> <laughs> so previous to 1970, when he started New World Pictures, uh, Corman had made a name for himself as uh, producing and directing a ton of movies uh, in the 50s and 60s. Oh, yeah. Schlock cinema. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, everything was made for 10 bucks, and, and it all made money. I mean, at the end of the day. Yeah, it was like uh, American Independent AIP. Yeah, AIP was huge. Um, he was a big, big part of that. Uh, what was the other one? There was another one that was like... the. There was one. Was it was AIP the one with all like the gimmicks, like the, the yes, the yes. sap and seats and the yeah. smell o vision and yeah, they were the the uh, f- grandfathers, I guess, of schlock cinema of like of g- gimmicky stuff. It was carny yeah. stuff. It was just like you know adding a little uh, electrical jolt to the seat. You know, yeah. it's not not super safe. Uh, all the no, time, you just no. had like a live wire on a seat that gave a person a shock <laughs> during you know when the guy was getting electrocuted. Well, you know, they spent money on that, so they didn't have to spend money on the movie. <laughs> just have a guy like burning a tire back back Ugh. behind the thing as the it's... tires burned out on the on the uh, the derby movie, the yeah. car derbies. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, it was anything they could to get people to to get in and watch the movie, mm-hmm. uh, and they didn't really care about the the quality of the film. Oh no! As long as it was made cheaply and made money. Yeah, and and a... look, it, that stuff was fun, man. Kids yeah. loved going to that schlocky cinema because. You got to see a couple of crappy movies, and you got a bunch of candy and popcorn and stuff, and yeah. and then there'd be that weird stuff happening to the seats or whatever. So you know, it was a, it was like it was a great way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, you get in, especially if it's hot. You get in, hang out in the air conditioning. There's also a really good movie from uh, I think like ninety ninety three or so. Yeah, with John Goodman called Matinee that that shows uh, he played Lawrence Woolsey. Yeah, who I believe was an AIP, or at least had a company. It might yeah, have been it was a, a, it was another, similar, like I, American I, Treasures, or you yeah, know. yeah. It was it was essentially about that time and 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 doing the like, yeah, you know, shocking the seats and exactly or doing all that stuff. You know the the rise of the drive-in theater. So yeah, it's like yeah. you had all of these um, theaters that needed content. I mean, it was kind of yeah, like now. Yeah. You know, it's like you needed a lot of cheap content to get the kids. The butts in the seats. Right, right. Yeah, especially at that time because the, the growth of uh, drive-ins and, and the movie, just theaters in general, was so huge. And, and anybody could go in and just start making movies because they'd play them. Exactly. I mean, it was a great opportunity for people like Roger Corman yeah. who really took advantage of that. And uh, he never lost a dime. No. Like, that guy no, is the no. most successful filmmaker and producer of all time. And yeah, the yeah. the most in de- the most successful independent filmmaker. Of oh time. yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, so after directing a ton of movies and starting his own company, Corman took a break from directing. He said, "Directing is very hard and very painful. Producing is easy. I can do it without really thinking about it." <laughs> Because all he has to do is just make sure he spends less money than he takes in. He just says yes or no, and then he walks around the sets and yells at people. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's there is a, there is a, a hierarchy Yeah, yeah. in the, both the office and on set where, at least when I was there, uh, there was a little bit of scare. Like, he was really <laughs> nice. He and his wife were both mm-hmm. really nice. But he... Everybody that worked in the office were all Ivy Leaguers, Harvard, oh, yeah, yeah. Princeton. Very intelligent people. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, that's the whole, that's every part of the yeah. film business is they're all Ivy League. 
<laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's so funny that like the schlockiest company has the most. Hey, but I, like Rodman Flanders worked there. Yeah, uh, he works with uh, Conan O'Brien. You mm-hmm. know, when I was there, uh, there was a ton of people that were there. But yeah, it's like y- your job isn't safe, especially. Right. They reward you if you work really hard. It's it's like a boot camp kind of, you know? I mean, if you bust your ass and you go the extra mile, you get rewarded. But if you just do just enough or not enough, right. you're going to not be asked back or you're going to get yelled yeah. at yeah. and stuff kicked at you. And <laughs> right, right, right. Totally, totally. Uh, so he established New World Pictures in 1970 after having a long string of successful films working for other people in Hollywood. Uh, New World Pictures was one of the most profitable movie companies ever, having turned a profit in its first 11 pictures they produced, making a profit of $3.2 million in its first financial year. It was a lot of money back then. Yes. And that's a lot of money for a... Usually, a a first... A company, a film company... Yeah. He's going to lose money for the first five or ten years. Yeah, for a long time. You know, long time. it's it, you got to establish yourself. Yeah. You know, you got to find the right stuff. Blibbity bloop. But yeah. he just was like, I got this figured out. And yeah. he's a very, very smart man. And he may not be the most creative man in the world. No. But he's no. an extremely smart businessman. And he knows yeah. this business. Right. He knows the business of show, Adam, <laughs> better than just about anybody. I mean, yeah. He, yeah. you know, you don't get to be that successful. By being a dummy. Right, right. You know, he knows who to hire. He knows who to surround himself with. And he knows how to make a, how to make money. Yeah, yeah. He, he definitely has figured out the process of how to make money in Hollywood. And he is just an insane uh, talent finder. Yes, yes. Uh, his second year, they would show a profit on 11 of the 12 movies he produced. Uh, and obviously, they would make enough money they'd make up for any losses. So didn't matter. The company always made money. Period. Uh, Coleman said New World was... The most successful independent film company in the country. If you count American International Pictures as a major, we're the best of the cheap acts. Yeah, it, it just at the end of the day, he knew how to spend just enough money to get people to sit down and not complain about being terrible. Well, he also knew where to cut the corners. And he also knew how to get hungry people that were smart and could cut corners and make it look like you did stuff without cutting corners. Right, right. Uh, yeah, Corman, like you said, Corman would take risks on people. He'd buck the trends of Hollywood to try and make good movies as cheaply as possible. His company would make a series of successful biker and nurse exploitation movies, giving a start to a number of cinematic artists. Oh, yeah, man, them biker movies. <laughs> oh. oh, bad boy bikers. Yeah, uh, Barbara Peters, the first woman to direct a biker picture, went on to direct Humanoids from the Deep for Roger Corman, as well as episodes of Remington Steel and Falcon Crest. Ooh. Uh, Curtis Hansen, who directed Sweet Kill, another biker picture for Corman, would later direct L.A. Confidential. Among a thousand other things. Among, yeah. Yeah, a million other things. Uh, George Armitage, whose directorial debut was under Corman, later directing Miami Blues and Gross Point Blank. Gross Point Blank, great movie. Great movie, absolutely great movie. Uh, Jonathan Kaplan's directorial debut. debut, who Debut? Le- debut. <laughs> Jonathan Kaplan's directorial debut, who later directed The Accused, uh, nominated for a bunch of Academy Awards. Uh, these all eventually led to a series of women in prison films. Uh, oh, yeah. Another genre that he exploited fully. Um, Jonathan Demme, who would later direct Cage to Heat for Roger Corman and uh, eventually The Silence of the Lambs winning Oscars. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, not just those guys, but it's but but uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah. Yeah. Francis Coppola. Yeah. All. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Robert De Niro. And a bunch of actors. Yeah. I, mean, act- I mean, actors, the list is huge. It's insane, but filmmakers, too. I mean, just about everybody who's anybody got their start there. Yeah, because he, he was making, like, 12 to 15 movies a year. And he would just go to the... He was like, you know, like Spielberg is, or was, you know, where he would, like, troll the... The festivals of yeah, you right, know, you know, they'd send him the films. He wouldn't like yeah. show up. Yeah. And be like, oh, the yeah. USC festival. Hey. But <laughs> Corman would, you know, he'd send his guys out to, you know, to see the work of these kids, and he'd be like, all right, who who made something good? Because yeah, you could see who has the vision because you got to make a lot with a little in film school. And back right. then, you know, we were all using film film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could really see who could do something on right. a budget. And so he, he just, he had a really, really extremely 
honed knack yeah, for yeah. snatching up that talent. Yeah. Uh, the irony being that um, having known a lot of actors now that work with, with uh, kids at USC, uh, some of their short film budgets at USC now are about what Corman was making his feature-length movies for back in the 70s. Oh, it's insane. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, <laughs> we're not even getting <laughs> yeah, into like, yeah, how much yeah, it costs yeah. now to go there. So, yeah, yeah of course. It's yeah. just... Uh, so while Corman mainly focused on producing action comedy films of various genres domestically, he was also uh, getting attention for distributing international films in the U.S. Uh, Corman's distribution side of New World brought many foreign films to mass audiences in the U.S. for the first time, with uh, movies from people such as Francois Truffaut, Peter Weir, Federico Fellini, and Akira Kurosawa. Yeah, he was able to get those films pretty cheaply to release. And at the time, there was a real, uh, you know, like, yeah, there yeah. was, you know, we were getting uh, cultured, you know, the yeah, counterculture yeah. was getting cultured and they wanted to see more foreign films and, you know, experience more things outside of America. Yeah. And he, again, was like, OK, I see this coming. So let's let's yeah. bring them in and we'll make we'll make the money, baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He also uh, brought in the Polish film Fantastic Planet, the animated movie, which is one of my favorite animated movies of all oh, time. Oh, that's great. Uh, fan, absolutely fantastic movie. But it would not be in the U.S. if not for New World and Roger Corman. In 1975, Corman financed Death Race 2000, which led to a string of car chase films. Oh, yeah. Which which also then also started uh, beyond doing his own movies, started the whole genre like the bigger pictures, you know, like Smokey and the Bandit and all these movies were made because they saw how much money Corman's car chase movies were making. They started with these, uh, uh, what's it called when the cars smash into each other? Demolition Derby. Demolition Derby movies. Yes, they yeah. started with these Demolition Derby yeah. movies. Yeah, and then they were like, "Well, what if we took it in the future?" <laughs> Made it, you know. Yeah, give it, give it more of a genre and give it a purpose. Yeah, we get David Carradine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not. I mean, Death Race 2000 is amazing. It's one of my favorite movies. All of these films are fun because there's real talent behind them. You know, yeah, there's a yeah. lot of really talented cats that are that are using their noggins to make these really interesting films with not a lot of budget. And, yeah, yeah. and you can tell. I, I mean, we're going to get into it, but, you know, Cameron really cut his teeth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he had to. But it's not – the fact is, is that I, this shows that not only was Corman respected, but these people just wanted to work. Like, yeah. everyone just wanted to work. Well, it know? was film school, man. I mean, you could – when I was working there, when I when I worked – in on the film, mm-hmm. The Terror Within Part Two. Nice. Quite possibly <laughs> nice. the worst movie ever released <laughs> on cine- on celluloid. Um You got rewarded, man. I mean I, I busted my hump. Like y- yeah. you don't understand the complex like the things that become so complex on a set. I was in charge of lunch. And yeah. And you know yeah. how oh, difficult yeah. it can be. <laughs> now now think of, of lunch when there were no cell phones. There right, were no right. men. There were actually, you know, things to click and touch. Yeah, you couldn't just hit up DoorDash. Mm. There was just m- menus and yeah, humans yeah. and a pad. And Corman only paid for the lunch of the above the line folks. Oh, really? So the cast, <laughs> the director, yeah, the, yeah. the DP, anybody below, we had to pay for our own lunch. Oh, wow. And so you would have to do two orders. And this is from a restaurant, not like a catering thing or anything. <laughs> right. So you would have the one order for every for the that the Corman's hires. paying for. Yeah. And then you have the other order that that everybody has to pay for. So you're collecting money you had again to collect money. Oh. from everybody oh, that's annoying. to do it. So I found this scam where I would find I would get the restaurant to give me like a twenty percent discount on one of the orders, right? And I would take the discount on, and I I apologize to all of the crew members <laughs> of a million years ago, but I would take the discount on their order, yeah, because it was bigger, and I would pocket the money because I wasn't making any money. It was yeah, an unpaid yeah, intern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would pocket the money, the difference. <laughs> so I would clear like forty or fifty bucks, you know, yeah, a yeah. day, yeah. By doing this scam, which was, which would keep me in, you know, beer and weed and yeah, yeah, stuff that yeah. I needed, you know, during the internship. So it's like you find ways to scam, but but the whole point was, I was impeccable. I got lunch on time because right, right. It, for those of you who don't know, within the film industry, if you don't do things on time, you get penalized. And if as you, you should, right. But <laughs> yes. 
in a Corman film, a penalty is death, baby. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, that's so much money. And so the one time that I didn't do the lunch, I got, you know, yeah, popped yeah. off on another run or something, and some other poor <laughs> bastard had to do it. It got so messed up. I come back, and, the, and we had this second second who all, just kicked shit all the time. Yeah, like, yeah. When he got mad kicked stuff all over the place and he's kicking stuff all i see him down the thing kicking stuff and i'm like what i lunch and i'm like well you ba 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 and then you know next day lunch is perfect <laughs> and i think that's why they offer me a job is because right, right. i was competent i got something done you know what i mean it's like, no totally totally and that's all this business is no 100% is competence showing up on time and doing your job because it's a bunch of left brain kooks man yeah, it's yeah, a bunch yeah. of creatives yeah. you get a bunch of creatives together it's like herding cats it's yeah. the worst and the best but yeah. yeah i mean that's what it was like back then i mean it was a constant yeah. state of fear yeah and and just non-stop i mean it was exhausting well sure of course it was i and that's true i mean that's not just true with, with corman i mean you're right it's, it's with everybody because i i before i moved to la i worked on an independent movie in iowa and i in the morning i would work on a TV morning show, 4 a.m. to 12.30, and then I would go work as a PA on this movie because I knew that most of the crew was from L.A., and I was going to move to L.A. after the movie was done. Yeah. And I impressed them enough that the second day I was in L.A., I got a job on the TV show house because I impressed them during this independent movie where I was not making any money. But you just kept diagnosing people <laughs> so accurately with these really – yeah. <sighs> Very, very unique yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and not very <laughs> typical diseases. But the fact is, is that it works. And, and, and that, that mode works. And, it, and if you do want to make it in Hollywood, you have to be willing to sacrifice for a while. Yeah, you got you to gotta eat your pride. Yeah. And you got to just put your head down and work. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, I, that, that's with anything, you know. I mean, you of put course, your head down and work, you're going to get ahead in life. If, you, if, you, if every job is a stepping stone and you, you're – pained to be there and it's way beneath you you're not going to get anywhere no, no. people aren't going to want to work with you yeah no totally it's it's really you know i, I mean it, it is all who you know in this business yeah in in, in the film business it, it is all who you know and it's all taking uh it, it's all taking advantage of opportunities when they come after when I when when they offered me the job, and I think it was like craft service or something on the next yeah, yeah. movie, but it was a job, and and the second was like you'll be doing my job in yeah. six months, yeah. and you could be directing in two years. Yeah, yeah. You know, if yeah. you play your cards right, you know, you got your shit together, and and I was like great, but then I didn't do it, and I figured well yeah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, when I come back, I'll just get a job with Corman, right? right. You know, and then but no, that's a year later, yeah, yeah. and they forgot. They're like who who. who? What was that? Who are you? No, we don't need you. We got a whole bunch of unpaid interns. Why would we hire you? Well, I haven't thought about that movie in years. Exactly. So it's just like yeah, it was a big wake up call. Yeah. But it's just the nature of the yeah, the business. It is. It is. What have you done for me lately, Adam? Yeah. yeah well, exactly. Uh, so with their car chase films, Ron Howard starred in the movie Eat My Dust in 1976, which led to a sequel, Grand Theft Auto, which was Ron Howard's directorial debut. Ron famously did the first movie. Yeah, he starred in the first movie, yeah. Because he wanted to direct. Yeah. And he knew I, yeah. that working for Corman was the best film school he could do. Exactly. So he just exactly. went down and he directed a few films for him. And then, you know, that's what took him all the way to Apollo 13. <laughs> None of these movies, every single one of these movies uh, that Corman did during the 70s had a 15-day film shoot. Yep. 15 days. That was it. Didn't matter how big the movie was, oh, yeah. how small the movie was. It, you had 15 days. And, that was and if you could reuse the sets, you reuse the sets. Of course you, you know, we. I mean, that was the easiest way to cut corners. The sets for the terror within part two were left over from some underwater, deep <laughs> monster movie thing. You know, it's it's all recycled. They just throw in a new coat of paint, a couple more buttons. I mean, he was great. He would just go raid. Uh, he would just go raid airplane Graveyards, yeah, yeah, pulling stuff, yeah, banks of buttons and it just and whatever just, you know. Yeah. The, the the where I don't think it's there anymore. But back when I worked there, the studio, yeah, I'm yeah, doing yeah. the quotes, yeah, was in Venice, and it was just this junkyard, yeah. Of it was so fascinating. Yeah, they called it the lumberyard. Yeah, yeah, the lumberyard exactly, and because it, it was a lumberyard, yeah, it just literally and, was, yeah. And uh, there was just crap 
hanging, you know, they'd be like, oh, there's part of an airplane. <laughs> there's three junk Jeeps, you know, it's just whatever was around and they would just cannibalize yeah. and pull apart, you know, had people to. would be That's, pulling stuff. It's the only way you could make money in this business. Oh, so is, much fun, is though. to make it a... Well, yeah. It you, was like being a kid with a junky toy box and you just pull junk out of it and, and like, all right, let's make a horrible movie <laughs> with a bunch of people that nobody cares about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All of Roger Corman's movie trailers were cut by Joe Dante and Alan Arkush. Uh, Corman gave them a chance to direct together on the film Hollywood Boulevard, which was the result of a bet between Roger Corman and one of his producers, John Davidson, to create the cheapest film ever made by New World Pictures. So hilarious. Uh, it extensively used footage from other New World Picture films, was shot on leftover stock from other pictures, what they called the ends. It was literally the stuff they yep. cut off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and it was short only, ends. Short ends, yeah. Them. And it was only given ten days to shoot instead of the usual fifteen. Had a budget of sixty thousand dollars, and it made a profit. And Joe Dante and uh, Alan Arkush went on to direct other films for Corman. Arkush directed Rock and Roll High School in nineteen seventy nine. Classic, absolute great movie with the Ramones. Yeah, yeah, it's a great movie. I literally the whole time I was writing the script, I had Rock and Roll High School stuck in my head. Yeah, and the poster was, I think, drawn by Dick. Dur- Dur- Dick Di Bartolo from Yeah, Mad I think Magazine. you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Uh, Joe Dante directed Piranha in 1978. Written another classic. Another amazing movie. Written by newcomer John Sayles, which was a critical and financial success. I love John Sayles. Oh, he he's is great. such a and he is a great actor too. Yeah. He is just yeah. so understated. And he is one of the grandfathers of independent cinema. Yes. I mean, his, yes. Uh Return of the Sakaka Seven. Yes. Yes. Which he made. Uh yeah. Uh yes. Oh, I was just going ahead. No, Sorry. it's okay. I was, yeah. Uh, Sales then wrote The Lady in Red for Roger Corman, released in 1979 and directed by Louis Teague, who went on to direct Cujo. So with the success of Star Wars, Corman wanted to cash in on this new genre, the space opera. So he turned to John Sales for a script about an epic space adventure. Sales had been working on his own directing debut, a film he also wrote, financed from the money he made writing scripts for Corman, called The Return of the Sakaka 7. Yeah. Uh, which is thought to have been inspired by the more popular, or to have inspired the more popular film, The Big Chill. Oh, Big Chill was a 100% ripoff of the Sakaka 7. The the Sakaka 7 was a much more realistic, uh, gritty indie version of, you know, seven old uh, rabble rousers from the 60s getting together and, you know, what have we become, you know, examining their lives after, you know, writing whatever manifesto they did in college and stuff. <laughs> it was a very interesting movie with a lot of really good performances. And uh, they just basically ripped that off for yeah. Yeah, the, the big chill. The big chill put in a, a bunch of Motown records <laughs> and made it about a suicide and a bunch of yuppies who gave nobody gave a crap about it. <laughs> yeah. It was it was great though because John Sales he had learned from Corman like he he specifically put the movie in one location in a, in a house cuz he knew he could shoot there wouldn't have to build sets like it was it's all about that Roger Corman film school mm-hmm. of making a movie as cheaply as possible oh, yeah you learn so much i learned a lot just by being there you yeah. know like oh you can use a smoke machine to create saturation and it'll right. ruin your life if you're a production assistant <laughs> because you'll have to sit there for 12 hours a day wafting smoke and you'll be blowing black boogers out of your nose yeah. for the next uh. 3 months <laughs> I think I got black lung from Janusz Kaminski. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Son of a bitch. (laughs) Sales would later go on to write and direct indie darlings throughout the 80s. Movies like The Brother from Another Planet. If you have not seen The Brother from... Joe Morton is amazing in that. It's a great movie. Uh, He was also in Terminator 2. Yeah. As the guy that was Skynet guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great actor. That film is just great. You got David Strathairn playing the man in black. Looking yeah. for him. It's just a really fun. It's like ET with a dude, you know. <laughs> basically, it's, it's like true. A, yeah, it's like yeah. indie ET with a with a except instead of an alien, it's a black dude. <laughs> yeah, David Strathairn and John Sales worked together a lot. Uh, he was in Return of the Sea as Seven as mm-hmm. well. That's where he got his uh, start. Yeah, I think it was his first or, or very early on uh, movie for him. But uh, Sales also did uh, Matawan, which is a great movie, uh, and Eight Men Out uh, about the. Baseball scandal and the like nineteen the Chicago Black Sox baby. They don't white that. Sox no more. They're Black no, Sox. No, yeah, they're the Black Sox. Shoeless yeah. Joe Jackson. He wasn't part of it, but they said he was. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great movie. It is it's a great. great movie. It is great. And John Sayles, 
Uh, I think he's in it too. But he's one of the announcers. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, he's in it. Yeah, he's a great actor. I, John Cusack's yeah. in it. Oh, Cusack's oh, such a good movie because it's a very complicated issue. You know, these guys were making no money. The owners yeah. were making all the money. The players were making dick. Nichols, and, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, they get this opportunity to actually make a ton of money, <laughs> you know, and it's, it, I get and, it. And you, somehow they're the bad guys. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sales also continued to write. He, he wrote The Howling and an early draft of E.T. when it was known as Night Skies. If you can find Night Skies, it's an awesome read. Yeah. It's a really interesting... Uh, listen to our E.T. episode for more info on the most famous movie that never got made. Yeah. Nice guys. It spawned like 80 movies from yes. Gremlins to E.T. Everything. to uh, Sophie's Choice. <laughs> it's an interpretation, but it's there. Yeah. <laughs> It's there. Uh, in true Corman style, he didn't give Sales much time to write the space film, which he titled Battle Amongst the Stars, before they changed it to Battle Beyond the Stars. Uh, to work quickly, Sales did what every good writer does. He borrowed the plot from another movie. I'm going to go on record saying there's never been a successful movie with the word amongst yeah, in the no. title. That is why it was changed. <laughs> Planet Amongst the Apes. Planet <laughs> <laughs> War amongst the stars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, See? yeah no, it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> so sales borrowed heavily from the Akira Kurosawa film Seven Samurai and its Western remake The Magnificent Seven, made in 1960. Uh, he would name the Akira from planet Akira, the peaceful people who are going to be destroyed in Battle Beyond the Stars after Akira Kurosawa. Clever. Yeah. It's an homage. <laughs> it's, well, he's yes. not ripping it off. It's no. an homage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, I gave him credit. I made the planet after him. Uh, but I, I honestly think that's one of the reasons why the movie works so well is because the plot is good. Yeah. And it's, the plot is proven <laughs> to be successful yeah. in two other movies. Yes, yes. It's the third iteration, or probably the 30th, but it's like at least the third. third. You uh, know? It would later get remade in Italian as a gladiator movie, uh, actually starring um, uh, Sybil Danning. Uh, in 1983 nice. as a gladiator film, essentially the exact same plot. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. The plot of a town needs some heroes. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, the poor people need help. It's basically uh, the Three Amigos is the Magnificent that is true. Three. <laughs> that is true. That's actually very true. The not so Magnificent Three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the film would be Carmen's highest... Carmen, Jesus. Carmen San Diego? Carmen San Diego. The film would be Carmen's highest budgeted film at $2 million, which is $11 million in today's money. That's a huge risk for him. Huge. He probably lost some sleep over that because, yeah. you know, Star Wars was only like three and a half million. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't much. much more than no. that. He but he knew he needed to spend more money on it because he knew that it would that it would A make more money, but yeah, B he just, had to look good. Yeah, because he saw, saw what happened with Star Crash. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Along with probably four other yeah. movies before that that were just crap. And Star actually yes, Beers. it definitely Star Crash because he was the reason why Star Crash got distributed. So he learned from his mistakes or other people's mistakes. Yeah d- Stay away from Marjo. <laughs> oh, poor Marjo. Oh, Marjo. Yeah. Go preach it to the choir, Marjo. <laughs> preach it to someone who cares. Uh, although the budget was $2 million, Corman did spend a large portion of this on two of the actors that were in the movie, Robert Vaughn and George Pappard. Uh, honestly, <laughs> half of that was real well spent. But, you know, fucking... I, I gotta be honest, yeah. Vaughn looks so bored. The so whole extremely time. bored throughout the entire movie. I've ne- I, he, Was he on Quaaludes <laughs> the entire time? Was he on... Did he just come from the dentist and he had been drugged to get yeah. a, a, a molar removed? I mean, the guy is, like, half asleep the entire time. The, yeah. Or he's frowning the entire movie. He's just looking up. Yeah, the, He's just the, kind of looking. The fight at the end where they keep cutting to the close-up of him, and it's the same shot over and over again of him <laughs> down, looking up, frown. Down, look up, frown. It's like, what was the direction? All right, you're in the waiting room of your doctor's office. You keep seeing the door open, <laughs> but they don't call your name. So you're a frustrated. So they keep opening the door, and they don't call your name, Robert. So keep giving me that kind of frust. Ooh, that's good frustration there, Robert. You look bored and frustrated. Yeah. Now, pew, pew, pew. Okay, fire the laser. Pew, pew, pew. Ooh, that's a little bit of life to you. Ooh. <laughs> 
he did come alive when he died. That yeah. was the only time his performance ever like had yeah. anything to it was when he was all covered in goo and dying. Yeah, when he crashed and he was yeah, it it was really interesting because it was a very one note performance. Yeah. Very, and that note was note. boring, Robert Vaughn. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're a great actor. And you were in the original Magnificent Seven playing the exact same part. Couldn't yeah. you just brought a little charisma with you? No. no. I'll do it. I'll play the part, Mr. Coleman. But I'm going to do it with zero charisma. <laughs> and I'm I'm barely going to open my eyes. <laughs> Here's the deal. I refuse to act in this movie. He was probably drinking uh, probably, the entire time. Probably. At least George Papard had some fun with his ridiculous caricature. Yeah. Yes. Of, yes. You know, of wherein uh, they, I, I think some... they, 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 they raided the Rockford Files uh, wardrobe <laughs> and got his dad Rocky's outfit. Yeah. It was literally Rocky. He yeah. looked like it was going fishing. Yeah, the whole time. The whole I'm time. a cowboy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> rootin', tootin', scootin', bootin', rootin', tootin', cowboy. I'm gonna go find some crawfish and, and mix some gumbo. What year is this, by the way? I, You know, it doesn't... It doesn't... It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I just... There's really serious cowboys still around on yeah. the planet Earth. Uh, also, when you're re-watching the movie, uh, definitely watch for the fact that Robert Vaughn literally never stands the entire movie. He's no. sitting the entire film. Ro- uh, Mr. Gorman... <laughs> I have another a demand in my rider. I don't want to stand in this movie. I want to sit for the entire film. So no acting and no standing. No right. acting. Okay. A, no acting. I will act like I'm in a doctor's office <laughs> waiting to be seen. And B, no standing. Uh, I need to sit. And I need a donut pillow for my hammies. <laughs> Got me some hams. He probably shot his entire thing in like half a day. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't be surprised. He was probably embarrassed. I mean, come on. I mean, the guy was such a great, I yeah. He's a great actor, yeah. man from Uncle. We'll talk about him more. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, so the Australian director, Richard Franklin, was attached to direct originally. Uh, he had directed the movie Patrick in 1978, a science fiction movie that started started the whole Ozploitation craze. Uh, it was a whole thing. Cinema in Australia in the late seventies, like with um, oh, like Oz is an Aussie. Yeah, not like no, Wizard not of like Oz. Wizard of Oz. No. And why is it spelled O Z? That's how they spell it. I don't know. But Australia isn't spelled with an O. I, I don't get Australian Australians. I, I'm, I'm not because they're kooks. <laughs> they're a bunch of kooks. Call your one Australian friend. Oh, you'll give me a Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, Richard Franklin would later go on to direct Psycho 2 in 1983. The uh, step um, down, baby. amazing <laughs> follow-up to Psycho. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, Richard Franklin, Franklin did not direct Battle Beyond the Stars. He was replaced by Jimmy T. Murakami, a veteran animator who had previously been an uncredited co-director on Corman's Humanoids from the Deep with Barbara Peters. Ooh. Yeah, that's uh, a really fun movie too. Humanoids right? from the Deep is a really great movie. Uh, I shouldn't say great movie; it's a fun movie. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's use our adjective yes. wisely, Adam. Uh, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film for *The Magic Pear Tree* in 1968. Uh, Mirakama would later work on a sequence for the adult animated film *Heavy Metal*. Uh, Which one do you know? It was called *Soft Landing*. It was the um, with the car, I believe. Oh, he's coming down. okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he would uh, later create the super hit cartoon Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He didn't create the comic strip, though. No, did. just the, the just the series. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it was all his his animation style and stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Roger Corman and special effects supervisor Chuck Comiskey initially hired James Cameron as a model maker for his studio after being impressed with his short film Xenogenesis. Uh, which I, of course he called it Zeno Genesis <laughs> nerd. <laughs> James Cameron is a nerd, totally. Uh, they asked him to create a design for the hero's warship. While other designers were using mainly geometric shapes, Cameron reasoned that since the ship had a female AI called Nell, it should have female curves and two mammary-like engines. It's actually kind of clever. I yeah. mean, not the boobs, but no, but it has the it has and stuff like it has yeah, a reasoning. It has behind thought it. behind it. Yeah, it just shows that Cameron's clever. I mean, he he's very good at yeah at effects. I mean, he's good. Uh, when asked about this by producer Roger Corman, Cameron called it a spaceship with tits. <laughs> 
Corman immediately liked it and put him in charge of the model on the spot. I love it. You're in charge of the model. I want those boobs. And now make one with a wiener. And now I want one with a big butt. A big old juicy butt. Mm, yeah, Cameron. Make me some ships. It is It is a very different design than all the other ships. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, the ship design. He later made him responsible for special miniature photography when no one on the set had experience with this, although Cameron did neither, but he at least understood the theory behind miniature photography. Yeah, you move the camera around the ship yeah. to make it look like the ship's move. I really, honestly, I think the theory is that you just overclock the, yeah. the film speed so yeah, it micro, looks bigger. Get some micro lenses, and then you, <laughs> you move the camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, I mean, that wasn't a very common thing back then. So No, I mean, it wasn't. Yeah. Working on the low-budget production meant that everyone had multiple jobs to perform. While working long days in order to finish his models and special effects on time, James Cameron often didn't bother to go home at night. He simply pulled out a prop gurney to sleep on for a few hours. Ugh, he probably stank. Oh, I'm sure he did. Everybody stinks there. They're all a bunch of stinks. i got to be honest. James Cameron probably still stinks. Um, what do you mean, as a he person? Seems, he just seems like that kind of person. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think... Okay, I don't think James Cameron stinks. All right, all right. <clears throat> guy's got a billion dollars. Yeah, I'm, okay. You're right. Hey, maybe. He might be one of those guys so, that uses natural deodorant. So did Steve Jobs, hey, and he hey, stunk. Hey, people. Hey, everyone who uses natural deodorant, <laughs> here's a tip. It doesn't work at all. <laughs> you <laughs> stink. So you agree with me. <laughs> okay, so maybe you all don't right. stink. Uh, one time, he was awoken in the middle of the night by associate producer Marianne Fisher, who informed him that the original art director had been fired. Although the original art director had come highly recommended, he was used to having a crew doing designs for him. Not having one meant that some of the sets had not been finished or even designed yet several weeks before shooting was to start. So they fired him. Fisher asked Cameron if he was interested in the job. Cameron had no precise idea what it meant, but he answered, Sure. And immediately fell asleep again. He was offered a salary hike from two hundred to three hundred dollars per week, but successfully negotiated for seven hundred and fifty, since that was what the original art director had been promised. And time was running out. That's a lesson for all of you: do not undersell yourself. That's what we're taught to do yeah. in this business, and that's what we're forced to do in this business. Yeah. But when you got these babies over a barrel, use it. If you got the juice yeah. to back it up. Get paid for what you're worth. Because if you start underpaying yourself now, you're going to be underpaid for the rest of that your career. That is 100% true. And don't forget that everything's a negotiation. Yep. Just because they come at you with a number doesn't mean you have to take it. You can negotiate for something else. Yeah. I think the best advice I could give anybody going into the entertainment business is value yourself and learn what your value is. Yeah. Find out what people are in your similar situation are getting paid and ask for 5% more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Cameron went from camera rigging to model maker to special effects technician to art director in just a matter of a couple months. That's how it goes there. Yeah. That's exactly how it goes because people are in and out. There, I, tell, I tell this story whenever I'm on production. I tell the story of, of Judd. Judd was an unpaid intern with me, and he was on the film The Terror Within Part Two. Quite possibly the worst film ever put on screen. <laughs> Judd was so incompetent, such a sweet little doughy, you know, uh, little puppy dog of a guy. You know, he's yeah. just a golden retriever wanting to please. But one of those guys that could not do anything right, did everything wrong, everything. And he got fired from an unpaid internship. He was Aww. that incompetent, poor Judd. Little, little Judd crying. Him him crying as he walks off the set Aww. in the Vasquez Desert was... I, look, I was so happy to see him go because he made everybody's yeah. job yeah. difficult. Yeah. He was horrible. Horrible. <laughs> but that poor boy. So I always tell people, don't be a Judd. Just don't be a Judd because, you yeah. know, yeah. you're going to go home crying. And yeah. You're never going to come back. And you're never going to work in this town again. <laughs> no. And it's just like, take a breath. Listen. Tell, let people tell you what to do and then do it. Yeah. You know, it's an yeah. easy job. Being it's not, a, yeah. Yeah. I it's mean, not hard. this whole business is pretty easy once you get comfortable with what you're doing. It's just this, there's a a bizarre sense of import, import yeah, put yeah. on this business because yeah. it's the least important business there is. I mean, it's yeah. great that we have entertainment and stuff, sure. but it's, we're not going to die if we don't have Stranger Things Season 4. <laughs> uh, that's what you think <laughs> and it's the stress man 
people stress themselves to death yeah. in this business because yeah. it's just it's 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 has to do with this false sense of import as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. You know, and all this money and all this stuff going on, but it's just people are scared to lose their job. It's just built. There's so much fear in this business. Yeah. It's oh, just no, sad. Totally. And uh, whenever it's, I get lucky yeah. enough to, you know, run something, then it or we do. Yeah, yeah. We we make sure that there is no fear. No, that, no, no, no. You know, we, people it's, are competent. Yeah. They know what they're doing, and everybody has a fun time. It should be fun. There, there are definitely companies out there like that that don't run that way. Yeah, and they're they're few and far between. But when yes. you find them, man, stay with them. Yeah, yeah. because really, it's people with the no a hole. Uh, policy that's the people you want to work with because it's just there's no reason to be a jerk no No, matter where you stand in the hierarchy you know everybody's in this together and usually the people lowest on the food chain are working the hardest yeah and you don't notice it because they're doing such a good job to make things so smooth for all the other bigger big wigs yeah you know so it's just everybody's in it together if if you're gonna you know whether you're the producer the director or the pa you know, you don't have to be a dick. Yeah, uh, we're that, all. Yeah. When I worked on House, there was a producer on there that literally she would get your attention, start talking to you, and then turn around and walk away as she was talking. And if you didn't follow her, you would not get all of her directions, and then she would get super pissed at you. And she was the most hated person on that set. Of course, because there's no reason for that kind of it was crap. So disrespectful, and it was so annoying. But she probably did it out of fear because she, you know, she's like, I got to be a hard ass. I got to work twice as hard because, you know, and it's, it wasn't that easy being a woman in. No, 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 no. I I mean, it still isn't. But back then it was even more. I had, I mean, I. Back in the forties when you were doing it. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't, uh, you know, I'm sure she outside of that was a fine person. Probably not because there are bad people. True. You know, and I think, unfortunately, Stressful situations bring out who people are. Yes. And if you're calm and you can deal with stuff, you're the kind of person yeah. I want to work for. If you freak out, you lose your mind, and you start yelling at people and blaming other people, then you're not somebody I want to work with. Yeah. And that's right. not who Roger Corman was. <laughs> James Cameron actually was fired and rehired twice during the production. Uh, he began to notice that producer Roger Corman would always be displeased with the sets when he came to inspect and found sec- – when he would find set decorators still working on them, he would start firing people. Yeah, because, because he, yeah. everything should have been done. <laughs> like that's if it's not done, then I don't want it. You know. Yeah, everything needed to be done yesterday. That was still the way. If he yeah. came to the set, everybody stopped working. Yeah, because yeah. you know it's just you didn't want to give him any reason to. Yeah, to, to pick. To, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, if Corman arrived on a half-finished set without anyone working on it, he always liked what he saw. So eventually, Cameron would have someone on the lookout for Corman's car, and whenever it was spotted, he would clear the set of crew members, no matter what state it was in. Corman would come in, like what he saw, give him a pat on the back, and move on. Looking good, fellas. I like it. I like the way you kind of just painted only a quarter of this part. <laughs> Makes it mysterious. It's an interesting artistic choice. Yeah. <laughs> Where is everybody, buddy? buddy. <laughs> By the way, it's really nice saving all that money on paint. <laughs> Good job. The whole crew's gone. Who am I talking to? <laughs> yeah. The low budget led to Cameron designing the spaceship's corridors out of spray painted McDonald's containers. Because you could, I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, everything is just a hodgepodge. If you yeah. really stop and look at the ships, you know, there's oh, like yeah. a cylinder that's probably made from a. a Tennis ball can, oh, you know, yeah, and yeah. then there's Our, look, one looks the main ship, the the bad guy ship looks like it's a vacuum cleaner, mm-hmm. like it's exactly it's just a weird vacuum cleaner. The main body of the Hephaestus space station, uh, where he meets the girl he eventually falls in love with, or um, the main character falls in love with, uh, it was made from a plastic terrarium salvaged from a garbage dumpster. Yeah, you just go, you'd go to the model shop, you get a bunch of uh, Rydell. Models, you know, with <laughs> yeah, the little, yeah. little pop out little pieces, and yeah. you would just make a pile of pieces, and you would even use like the parts that the pieces came on, yeah, and yeah, the packaging whatever. and everything yeah. is just it. Those little chunks are what make you know these ships so yeah. realistic, and it's just gluing on chunks. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, Despite all this, his hard work paid off as the special effects were one aspect of the film highly received by both fans and critics, opening the door for his later... It looked great. I mean, for the time, they were great. I mean, it it was very seamless. The ships were cool. Yeah, they looked great. I mean, I wasn't... I I didn't like all the design of all of them, but but they looked good. But they held up for the time. Yeah. They had the horrible... The Yeah, the sound effects were not great. (laughs) 
Uh, James Cameron met Gail Ann Hurd on this film and would start a very successful partnership with her. Uh, he would direct, she would produce. They would make The Terminator and Aliens, eventually get married in the 80s before they worked on The Abyss in 1989, which would ruin their professional and romantic partnership. Because they stared into The Abyss. Yeah. And The Abyss stared back and said, your marriage is a sham. <laughs> Uh, according to, to Gail Ann Hurd, actor Bill Paxton was employed on the set as a carpenter, which is where she first met him before working with him in Cameron on Aliens. She said, So my first memory of Bill was him pounding nails and cracking everybody up. I mean, we'd be working at three or four in the morning and he would be the one who kept all our spirits up. He was that person on and off the set. I just really love Bill Paxton. Yeah. So I, yeah. He so was one sad. of those people I wish I'd met. Um, yeah, I mean, he was the real deal. He was a guy that, you know, st- like, just like uh, our old buddy Harrison Ford. Yeah. Started as a carpenter. Yeah. You know, worked his way up, loved what he did, got to work with his best pals. Yeah. And just appreciated the fact that he, you know, had such an amazing career, but also well-deserved. I mean, the guy was an amazing actor and way, way too soon. So many great things. Yeah, he yeah, that makes me so sad. He had he had such a long career still yeah. before he passed. If you want to see like some really really good Paxton, watch that uh, that Mormon show he did. Oh, uh, Big Love. Big Love. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's some. That's some. That's he Pax. had some great stuff. Like he directed Frailty. And, oh yeah, and Frailty is amazing. And, but but I mean that was a really different. That was a departure for him. Yeah, Big Love, yeah. and it was a really oh, yeah, interesting yeah. show, and it. You know, it explored the mysteries of Mormonism. I will always love Bill Paxton because of Weird Science. He was absolutely my favorite character in it. Oh, yeah. Because he was just such a dickbag, but it was so great and so funny. Hey, Grammy. Hey, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about casting. Casting. Yeah. Uh, in the lead was Richard Thomas's Shad, a young Akira farmer who looks for mercenaries to save his people. Uh, he was best known for his leading role as budding Arthur. Oh, sorry. Arthur? Yeah. Arthur. <laughs> Arthur. Yeah. He was best known for his leading role as budding author John Boy Walton in the CBS drama series The Waltons, for which he won an Emmy. Good night, John Boy. Yeah, no. Good night, John Girl. <laughs> Good night, Deborah Girl. <laughs> Good night, Papa Ban. Good night, Mama Girl. Good night, Grandpa Man. Good night, Grandpa Lady. Grandma Lady. <laughs> <laughs> also Grandpa Lady. You know, I honestly, and I'm I'm not joking, I honestly think that he would have had a bigger career if he had that mold removed off of his face. You think so? It worked for John Boy, because John Boy was a very, yeah. you know, I mean, that was a very wholesome show. Yeah. About him yeah. trying to write, but he's got 8,000 brothers and sisters <laughs> that, that keep getting on him because he's got to do his chores. Yeah. You know, but he just, he was very earnest young man, but I think that, that mole, man. It, yeah. It, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it possibly. Hey, very possibly. if he didn't have that mole, he would have been Luke Skywalker and not Akira Kurosawa. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> from the Akira planet of Akira. Shad. 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 Not Chad. Shad. I'm Shad. <laughs> I'm Shad. I'm Shad M- Mickelson yeah. from the uh, East Bay Mickelsons. Uh, l- later, uh, Richard Thomas would star in the 1990 television miniseries adaptation of Stephen King's epic horror novel, It. It throws and... his fist against the post and still insists it sees the ghost. <laughs> throws his fist against the post and still insists it sees the ghost. Later, he would, uh, more recently, he would play Special Agent Frank Gadd on FX spy thriller series, The Americans. He's still got a career. He's still got a career because he did John Boy. Yeah. I mean, he's got, he's a good actor. I mean, I, I thought he was good in this movie. He's I, fine. Yeah. He's, you know. he's, he's good. He's an earnest young man in this movie. <laughs> Just like he was an earnest young man on The Waltons. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Robert Vaughn is guilt, a notorious assassin with an intergalactic bounty on his head. Oh, such a um, cool description for the most boring character in the movie. Yeah, that's true. He was most well known as the spy Napoleon Solo in the 1960s series The Man from Uncle. Still, one of the greatest names in all of television. Yeah. Napoleon Solo. Uh, and also for appearing as the gunman Lee in The Magnificent Seven, essentially the same character. Yeah, the, the, the Akira Kurosawa where he did act. Yeah. Where he right. put a little effort into it. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he uh, actually stood up. Yeah, he actually walked yeah. <laughs> and did things. Yeah. Uh, later, he would appear as General Hunt Stockwell in the fifth season of the 1980s series The A-Team with George Pappard. 
Uh, it also starred John Saxon as Sador, oh, leader yeah. of the evil Malmori Raiders, who is really old but keeps himself alive using transplants to renew his body. Saxon's an interesting dude. He's been in a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, he was in over 200 projects during the span of 60 years, yeah. uh, mainly westerns and horror movies. He played cops a lot in horror movies. Uh, he was in Black Christmas in 1974, one of my favorite horror movies of all time. Uh, Tenebre uh, by Dario Argento, which is my favorite um, Argento movie in 1982. And uh, Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984. Uh, the, he was the dad. Yeah. He? yeah. he was the father of the young lady. Yeah. Oh, the yeah, yeah. What, I don't remember her name. Barbara. Anyway. Barbara, that's right. Was it Barbara? I think it was Barbara. Uh, anyway. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll find out when we do that in uh, October. That's true. Uh, George Papard played the space... Or it's not the, he just played Space Cowboy. I'm Space Cowboy, George uh, Papard. He was the only character from Earth. Uh, he was defined by his many one-liners and Roger. who became Shad's good friend. Roger, I'll do it. But I, gotta, I get to smoke and I get to drink whiskey out of my belt. I want a belt. Actually, I want that belt. Uh, that, that, that belt was rad, except for the one shot where it looked like he was peeing into the cup. <laughs> yeah, but it had <laughs> ice. That belt had ice, it had, soda, yeah. and whiskey. It was it like was, the perfect bar belt. It was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing. It must have been cold making with that Freon making ice right above his tallywacker. <laughs> uh, the character was really interesting because there was – it wasn't the Confederate flag, but there was kind of a hint of – a southern flag on his ship. Uh, it, it, it just, the whole thing didn't really make sense. It was dumb. It was it just didn't make like, sense. it was almost as if it was the Italian version where they're like, yeah. let's do a stereotypical uh, the cowboy in the Americas, and yeah. I do the stereotypical um, uh, Italiano. <laughs> To make him a point. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Papard was best remembered for his role as struggling writer Paul Varjak in the 1961 film Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah. And which I literally did not realize that was George Papard. Yes. I mean, he had a big career back yeah. then. I mean, yeah. he was a pretty big dude. Yeah. Uh, later, he would play commando leader, lieutenant colonel, and Colonel John Hannibal Smith in the 1980s television series The A Team. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> it was good. Great. I kept waiting for him to say that in this, but I realized it was before, it was before. the A team. Yeah. That's why it looks so young. Yeah. <laughs> young. He was yeah. Drunk. See, I think here's the difference. Robert Vaughn was a sad drunk, and George Papard was a happy drunk. <laughs> so when they true. got real drunk before filming, and during probably, yeah, yeah. allegedly. We see the performances. We got sleepy Robert Vaughn sitting in his chair. I just want to go home. I hate it here. I want to be done. And then George Papad's like, give me another hat, and I'll give me my belt, and I'm going to drink some Robert Vaughn's. Uh, I, I will say in Robert Vaughn's defense that the character was written not very well. I mean, you kind of you kind of write the character into a corner. Like, what are you supposed to do with that? I don't know. Show some emotion. I don't know. But you, you've you won. Like, you're literally, it's like the end of his story. It's just not interesting. He's playing him bored because the character's bored. The only reason why the character's doing it is for a free meal and a place to sleep. Because he's made, you know, he's done everything and, and killed everybody yeah. and nobody wants to work with him and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you don't have to be so bored about <laughs> it. We get it. You could, yes. That's true. That's true. Uh, I do want to also point out that it is implied that um, uh, Sador and his crazy stellar, what the hell is it called? Stellar, the the thing that turns the plants into suns. Mm -hmm. uh, stellar exchange, I think it was called. Um, sure. Or something like that. Yeah. Uh, really it's implied heavily that uh, in the movie that Earth uh, was attacked by him and that it was turned into another sun. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, but apparently they still managed to keep up the rootin' tootin' cowboy <laughs> stereotype toot, 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 however scandal. long after it was that this happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, he, since George Papard was one of the people that was paid very highly like uh, Robert Vaughn, he was not in the movie that much. Like, That's the whole deal, he was man. such a minor character yeah. in it. The reason why you get those guys in is because you give them little parts. You don't yeah. pay them to be the stars. You pay them to show up for I, a few days. Yeah. It just seems out of proportion, but that's, you know, I don't know. Uh, 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 Nicholas Cage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, Darlan Flugel as yeah. Nanelia, Dr. Hephaestus' beautiful daughter and Shad's love interest. She was 
a really good actress, actually. She was yeah. really good in To Live and Die in L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she, this was her first major part, and, yeah. and she had a great career. Uh, she was in Once Upon a Time in America as Robert De Niro's girlfriend uh, in uh, uh, Tough Guys, uh, playing Kirk Douglas's girlfriend. Played a lot of girlfriends. Uh, and she uh, live, live or Die in L.A. as Ruth Lanier, the love interest of Secret Service agent Richard Chance. And in 1986, she portrayed Billy Crystal's ex-wife, Anna, in the buddy cop action comedy Running Scared. Yeah, back when you could be wives or ex-wives. And that was pretty much it. She had a, she played lead parts and other stuff. But, I mean, yeah, yeah it but was... But that's kind of what it was back then. It was um, awful. It's indicative of how Hollywood was just kind of crappy back in the day. Yeah, I mean, not and then I once she hit yeah. 30, then you were the moms and the grandmoms. He became the ex-wife instead of the girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sybil Danning as St. Xmin. Uh, a Valkyrie warrior looking to prove herself in batter, battle, as or as they called it. And the, batter, the, like uh, <laughs> in the pages of Penthouse magazine. <laughs> That's true. Uh, this was her first film role, uh, at least her first American film role. Uh, it would lead her to become what they called the queen of the action pictures. Queen she, of the bees. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, she was in a lot of B movies. A lot of uh, prison movies, ladies' prison movies. Yeah, stuff like Caged Heat and Hercules in 1983, Malibu Express and Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf mm. in 1985, and Reform School Girls in 1986. Uh, she did a lot of uh, a lot of nudity, a lot of nudity. What? In fact, uh, <laughs> leading to that, the wardrobe department had a difficult time keeping the top of her costume on and had to re- resort to using Band-Aids to prevent said top from slipping off. Yikes. Uh, because it really wasn't a top. It was more just straps. Oh, and there was a lot to hold in. And yes. And it wasn't yes. a lot holding it in. Uh, that being said, she was the only actor to win an award for the movie. <laughs> she won was... a, a Saturn Award for Outstanding Achievement. Yeah, by like the... <laughs> Which By sitting the most awkwardly <laughs> uncomfortable way to fly your spaceship, it looks like she was on a bed of nails. She was at a 45-degree angle, could barely see no. the, the controls. Like, it made no sense. No, it didn't. I don't really understand the design for that. But she was a battler. Um, and I do want to point out that the Saturn Award for her Outstanding Achievement Award it just proves that nerds are just horny little boys. Ugh. Yeah. Well, at least back then. Now they're horny Old boys. People of all (laughs) genders and types. Yes, yes. Uh, It did. The movie was nominated for four other Saturn Awards. It just didn't win any of them. Sure. I mean, it's not a bad. It's a B movie, but it's not a B B bad movie. No, no, totally, totally. It's entertaining. Uh, Sam Jaff is Doctor Hephaestus, uh, an old man on life support who wants grandchildren to inhabit his station. Yeah. What? It was so weird. I just the, the look at the best acting that Richard Thomas did was when he realized that he was like, "Wait, you want me to mate with your grandkid? Like yeah. what?" It was great. Yes, I do. Yeah, yes, we want babies around here. I'm tired of cyborgs. Yeah. Yes, have, you do the do. Put uh, put together the mating room for them. Mm, <laughs> set up the cameras. I want to watch my granddaughter do the hokey pokey, pokey pook. Uh, Sam Jeff had actually been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1951 for his performance in The Asphalt Jungle. Yeah. Uh, later appeared in the classic films The Day the Earth Stood Still in 1951 and Ben-Hur in 1959. And now is basically a washing machine with a head. <laughs> <laughs> wanting to have, desperately wanting John Boy to have sexual relations with his so granddaughter. So true. So true. Uh, Jeff Corey as Zed the Corsair, once a famed Akira warrior and now almost blind. Uh, he, Jeff Corey was actually on his way to becoming a very famous actor in the 40s and the early 50s before being blacklisted by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, so because he couldn't get work in Hollywood, he turned to teaching acting. Some of his students included... Robert Blake, James Coburn, Richard Chamberlain, James Dean, Jane Fonda, Peter Fonda, Michael Forrest, James Hong, Luana Anders, Sally Kellerman, Shirley Knight, Bruce Lee, Penny Marshall, Jack Nicholson, Roger Corman, Daryl M. Smith... Diane Varsi, Sharon Tate, oh. Rita Moreno, Leonard Nimoy, Sally Forrest, Anthony Perkins, Rob Rainer, Robert Town, Barbara Streisand, and Robin Williams. Woo hee woo hoo. Yeah, uh, it literally just the cavalcade of people that he taught in the the late fifties and early sixties was pretty incredible. Yeah, should have taught some restraint to a couple of those. People. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Morgan Woodward is Cayman of the Lambda Zone, a Zymer enslaver who has a score to settle with Sador for destroying his entire species. Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. 
<laughs> uh, previously, Morgan Woodward was best known for his portrayal of Boss Godfrey, the sunglasses-wearing man with no eyes, the 1967 film Cool Hand Luke. He would later go on star as Marvin Punk Anderson on the television soap opera Dallas. We seem to have a failure to communicate. Yeah, he was great in that movie. I... Hey, I'm going to eat a bunch of eggs. <laughs> Give me some eggs and I'll eat them. Uh, Earl Bowen as Nestor won the voice, uh, usually for the five clones. I was astounded that that was the dude from Terminator movies. Yeah, the uh, Earl Bowen, best known for uh, playing criminal psychologist Dr. Peter Silberman in all of the Terminator movies. <laughs> I also love his name, Earl Bowen. <laughs> Earl Bone. He should have a furniture store. Earl Bone, come. Come get a boner at Earl Bone's Bones. <laughs> uh, he's the only actor besides Arnold Schwarzenegger to appear in each of the first three Terminator movies. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so this was composer James Horner's third film score. Uh, he had previously worked on Roger Corman's Humanoids from the Deep and The Lady in Red, and the producer brought him back for Battle Beyond the Stars. The score features several elements that would become regular staples of Horner's many science fiction and adventure film scores. Uh, several, several fans have noted similarities between these scores and those for later films, such as Kroll and Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Yeah, he's got a style. I mean, you know, does. you can I mean, tell yeah. a... Uh, John Williams score. Yeah, just exactly. By hearing exactly. It. I mean, there's a sound it's, to these guys. I don't think he's ripping se- himself off. I mean, maybe, it's, yeah. maybe he's only got like ten notes in his repertoire. That's possible. Uh, Horner would go on to become a regular collaborator with James Cameron, eventually winning an Academy Award for Best Original Score for Titanic. Oh man, <laughs> I had, a, oof, I had a girlfriend that liked to be intimate with the Titanic soundtrack. Oh really? Yes. Aye, aye, aye. And then she'd be like. And now they're getting on the boat. And it was very distracting. <laughs> and I can't listen to that soundtrack. I can't. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Uh, the supervising sound editor, also responsible for special sound effects, such as Robert Vaughn's laser shot. Pew, pew, yeah. Pew. Uh, it was based on Clint Eastwood's 44 Magnum from Dirty Harry. Didn't sound like it. Uh, no, I think it was the, I think it was the gun itself oh. it was based on. Yeah. Uh, it was David Udall, a regular contract worker for Corman Films. Uh, Udall later remarked on the film's frugal sound editorial budget and his practical art of motion picture sound and explained some of the movie sounds. Each of the seven spaceships had its own unique sound. Like, the Nestor ship sound was made from human voices generated by the community choir from his hometown college in Coalinga, California, and Robert Vaughn's ship was based on the recording of a dragster. I've always wanted to be a sound recordist because I just love, like, watching the documentaries about Star Wars and all this and watching the sound guys just walking around, like, hitting fences, go, oh, hitting yeah, fences yeah. and just finding new sounds and stuff. Uh, there, I did a short film where we built the sound from scratch with Marty, our old pal, oh, yeah. who yeah. was on one of the shows. And we did it, and it was just so much fun with the little microphone getting oh, drips, yeah. drops, and just, you know, it's just really fun to, to I, I, just creating things out of other sounds and stuff is is just fascinating and fun to me. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it's, it is an, a unique art. Uh, the Starship footage was reused in another Roger Corman science fiction film, Space Raiders, of which it was. was really bad. Of course uh, it was. <laughs> as well as the ultra-low-budget Corman features StarQuest II, Vampirella, The Fantastic Four, which was never actually released. Oh, there's some good footage of that, though. Oh, it's uh, you can find it online now. Uh, Dead Space and Forbidden Worlds, because that is what you do when you make movies that make money. Oh, yeah. Well, you just, re- he, like I said, he would reuse the reuse, sets, yeah. he would reuse the props, the costumes. Well, what he would do is he would look at the sets and say, okay, write me something that takes place in this set. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You I know? mean, And then yeah. they would be like, okay. You have these sets, make a movie uh, based around it. And it, it, at the time when I was there, it's like, make a movie about an underwater, underground, or some sort of base, maybe in space, but a base, and maybe there's <laughs> a monster after us. Who knows? Let's just make another type of alien. It was like 80 different alien movies. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> the same footage was also reused in later films and video games. A clip from the film in 3D is shown during the movie theater fight scene at the end of Bachelor Party, and footage was also used for the laser disc game Astron Belt. Uh, that game was awesome. Was it? I don't know. I have, I have no idea. I've never heard of it, so I have no idea. But it's a laser disc game. That's cool. Well, yeah, that's like uh, um, 
That's like drag Dragon's Quest? Uh Dragon Quest? Dragon's Lair? Dragon's no. Lair. That's Dragon's like Lair? Dragon's yeah. Lair and Space Ace. Yeah, Those Space were Ace, laser, yeah, disc, laser games. disc games. Yeah. Those were so rad. Uh the soundtrack was later recycled by Corman for Raptor and other movies. Uh he reused it a lot. Corman was yeah. a recycler of he everything. Had to. I mean, that was his thing. I that's how you made money. You never threw anything out. That's why yeah. the lumberyard looked was like a junkyard. <laughs> Because <laughs> never threw anything out. Because you could always use something. It looked like, you know, helicopters. Cra- it, it, it was like Black Hawk Down. Yeah. You know, there's just crap everywhere. It was amazing. So uh, the movie would go on to make $11 million in box office, which is just over $38 million in today's money. Great. Although, because Corman was so brilliant, he didn't need it to make any money because he sold the international yep. rights for $2.5 million. Yeah. Warner Brothers released it, and I think Orion Pictures. Yeah, Orion Pictures, yeah. Uh, was international? International, mm-hmm. yeah. Orion was really big a back in the day. Back, yeah. I don't think they're around anymore. Yeah. He also uh, sold the TV rights to HBO for just under a million dollars. So literally before it even went to theaters, it was profitable. Yeah. I saw it in the theater. I did. Yeah. I enjoyed it. You know, I knew John Boy, and it had the, the space guy. But I always get... The funny thing is, is I always get Star Crash in this movie mixed up. The characters oh, really? in it. Oh, I yeah, think, yeah. I think that the lizard guy is in Star Crash, and then the robot guy is in Battle Beyond the Stars. Right. Because they're just kind of like similar yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and, the, yeah. and the lizard guy is very similar to the lizard guys in uh, – he's very like a green version of the last Starfighter mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I That would not surprise me in the slightest. But still, it's just – it's a fun watching it again. It was really it was a fun movie. It's mostly just a space battle movie. Eighty yeah. percent of it is dogfights. There's my only real critique of the movie is that there are some action sequences that go on for just a little too yeah. long. It's not a great movie, but it's yeah. by no means a bad movie. And in no, terms yeah. of our our Star Wars ripoffs, <laughs> I think it's in the top tier. Yeah, I would you agree. Know? I would agree. Uh, you know, I don't count sp- Spaceballs because that's a you know, it's a it's satire. It's an intentionally yeah. rip-off movie, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, of course it's the best. But but in terms of all these forgettable, you know, uh, the black hole. I mean, all of these movies, these science fiction movies yeah. that came out around the same time, they weren't necessarily actual rip-offs of Star Wars. No, no. Many of them were with, their, yeah. with the laser swords, <laughs> you know, and their hairy monsters. <laughs> and their droids. And, and the and robots. Their, yeah. Um, they, a lot of them had elements of it. But this one... You know, these sales smartly ripped off the source material rather than the source material. Well, and, and he, but he made the characters interesting. I mean, even Robert Vaughn, you know, his backstory is interesting despite him not being interesting in the movie. But like, it's all the characters were well defined. Yes, because they were well defined by a character. So, but, uh, but yes. Yes, and John Sales. John yes. Sales is a good writer. John he, Sales is a great writer. Yes. And within the parameters. And look, this is also something that was probably written in like five days. Oh, I would not doubt it. You know, you're not spending a year rewriting and rewriting on no. draft three of the script and getting notes. It's like you put this thing, and this is typewriter writing too. Yeah, this is. Ting, <laughs> you oh, know, yeah, yeah. So it's not this. You know, it's it's a whole different animal, and uh, is this was the golden era of Corman, which was uh, the early '70s. To like the mid '80s, yeah, yeah. That's when he shined. He found he had the great talent. He had all the good yeah. kids working for him, and it was just a, a a perfect time for making films and a perfect time, you know, because uh, we were getting the home video market, so he's getting more stuff yeah. going. And I think that's part of kind of what killed it is because they were they're making too much stuff. Yeah, I and mean, it definitely got to the point where there was oversaturation. Uh, and you got guys like and and you know, no offense. To Jim Wynorski, but, you know, it's like Jim Wynorski didn't go on to do anything more than just booby movies. And he's still yeah. doing booby movies today. I think he yeah. made some Bigfoot movie, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and back when I, you know, the 30 years ago, he was making Slumber Party Massacre at yeah. Corman, you know. So it's like the guys that, that were working in the, you know, 90s and stuff, they're more schlocky guys still. You know, it's yeah, like we're, yeah. it's kind of the magic time was gone. You know? Yeah. Well, and it's in, and really in the, in the nineties, that's when movies it late eighties and nineties is when the movie started just becoming too expensive to make. Like you couldn't, you couldn't turn a profit no. because it, there just wasn't, 
the the ceiling was hit of where you could go to make money on movies like this. Now they just need to create a green screen room. And yeah, they can just make whatever. But I mean, Corman's got to be in his nineties. I mean, he's he's ninety six. Yeah, still kicking. Uh, he's still around. I mean, he's not working. Obviously, no. he but, and his wife though he's around. were they were. I mean, this is he was in his I guess sixties when I was there. Yeah, and he was. Hands on, man. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. sharp as a tack. And his wife, even more so. I mean, she was more running the business than he was right, day to day. Right. Um, but they were still running a tight ship. And, you know, one of the favorite things that we would do when we worked in the office is during our lunch, we would go and grab the the box of tapes of submissions. Oh, nice. And watch people's nice. short films and stuff. And we found some really fun films. We found this film called The Spirit of 76. Oh. There was like a time travel movie where people went back to 1976. And yeah. I don't know if it was ever released. It might have been, but it was I, actually a really good really movie. Familiar. Yeah, I think really we familiar. recommended it. We were like, yeah. you got to look at this movie. Yeah, it's actually yeah. really funny. <laughs> but they weren't doing a lot of comedies back then. But still, it was just, you know, it was a really... It was a great place to work. It was a great place to learn. Yeah. And if you really put your head down and kept your eyes open, you know, I learned more in that summer internship than I did in two years of film school. Right. right. You know, I learned how to – everything I learned in film school was pretty much uh, useless now because it was all yeah. film. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. not putting on a white glove and cutting negative <laughs> anymore. But all the stuff that I learned on Corman – made me a good one man band. So when I was doing, you know, projects for people where, you know, you're shooting and cutting and you cutting corners, I learned how to make stuff for no money that would look like it was much, a pretty good yeah, budget. You know what I mean? Expensive, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You learn how to upscale by that. And yeah, and that yeah. was just by, you know, learning the tricks of the trade. All right. Well, we're out of time, so we'll be back uh, next week with Spaceballs. Oh yeah, the best of the best. Excited Spaceballs. Excited for that. Yeah. Yeah. May the Schwartz be with you. <laughs> Goo I know. I yeah. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming, the Bob Newhart Show, already in progress. <laughs>